I originally thought that uh, this topic would show some interest. I'm glad that you are here. Uh, I don't see a whole lot of our colleagues here. I say are because they're my colleagues as well. Uh, but we'll give them another four or five minutes. <laughs> and then if uh, they don't come, then we'll, uh, we'll proceed and then we'll be a much more intimate group. No, I just see, he says he hears you okay in there. All right, so. fine. All right, so. good. <coughs> okay, talk a little bit. Okay, I'm talking now. Testing, one, two, three. <laughs> Testing. You know, yeah. should I just speak in? No. Let's see. Yeah, let me see the little, little of one device here. Maybe it, little button. This one? No, the, the little um, okay. body pack, if you will. He said he can hear you fine, but he can't really hear you in here. Okay. All right. Georgie, how are you? I'm okay. How come? You know, we, we have, we think we have a quorum here, but it's not great. We might have a quorum. No, <laughs> Today, I think there are competing meetings, which uh, really we, we should come to the bottom of. We can't, we shouldn't have a vascular meeting going on there when we have cardiovascular grand rounds and the rats rest. So, I implore upon the committee members and those of us who <laughs> who uh, uh, do the planning to uh, probably do a little bit better planning. In any case, uh, the reason why I'm giving this grand round today is that. Uh, we had a cancellation, and, and rather than cancel Grand Round, I looked into my uh, uh, potpourri of talks and uh, came up with this one, which is a, a very, um, uh, very fond uh, uh, memory and a uh, exercise that uh, took place a long time ago uh, based on my interest in uh, the virtues of courage, and hence the name of uh, the a partnership and courage, and the idea is that how do we interrelate with our parent, our patients, how they show courage, how we show courage. The definition of courage, uh, one can look it up easily, it's, uh, it's the individual's selfless pursuit, selfless, of a moral good while risking personal harm, injury, or death. I think this is pretty clear. Corporal courage, that is to say courage that uh, 
that affects our bodies so that we could get injured or die in defending God, country, family, and self against foe, which could result in direct personal injury or death. We all know about these things, people winning awards and more, and, and even in their peacetime. Intellectual courage has an interesting historical approach. People like to write about this because it has so many uh, virtues uh, that, when, that are obvious. John Kennedy, when he was running for president, wrote a book called Profiles in Courage. And in that book, he had uh, the Senator Edmund Ross, uh, who uh, at the time was about ready to d deliver the last vote to not only uh, impeach Johnson, who was the president at the time after Abraham Lincoln was killed, uh, his vote was the last vote, and if he had voted to, to convict, then Johnson would have been removed from office, but he chose not to, based on uh, good reasons that he had. But that was a profile in courage, to be sure. That was an, uh, a Kentucky surgeon uh, in the early part of the 20th century who uh, operated, did a first laparotomy to remove a tumor. Imagine in Louisville, Kentucky, what would have happened if that patient either had died or was a bad mishap, but, but it wasn't. And uh, he was uh, faced with a certain uh, uh, disintegration of his, uh, of his, of his um, career. And of course, we all remember the wonderful book and movie, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, and that famous uh, de defense of an innocent black man by Atticus Fitch. Uh, if anyone ever saw a, uh, a courtroom drama, that was it to remember. The courage that Gregory Peck showed or portrayed was uh, something for the ages. Well, uh, partner, courage goes back to the uh, ancient days and before. Uh, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, adjectives, it's intellectual, it's moral, corporeal, steadfast, intrepid, heroic, extraordinary, and of course that phrase of above and beyond the call of duty that is associated with the Medal of Honor in the United States. Synonyms include fortitude, daring, bravery, bravery and valor. Uh, Plato wrote on courage, and he included that in the four cardinal virtues. These were well uh, understood uh, uh, descriptions of uh, how to conduct our lives. And there were prudence, temperance, courage, and in the end, Plato thought that justice was the balance of all of these virtues. And true courage is tempered by reason, always reason. Aristotle came after Plato, as we know. He was a student of Plato. And he brought forth a, a definition of moral uh, uh, excellence that's used today. If you were going to memorize anything today, it would be this. Uh, moral virtue is the habit of choosing the golden mean between extremes as it relates to a, an emotion or an action. Well, what does that mean? Uh, Moral virtue is the habit of choosing, so it's a lifelong learning process, right? When we say we, we are trained to do something, we do it over and over and over again the correct way, and it becomes part of our life, becomes part of our ethos, becomes part of our daily function. So it's the habit of choosing. And what do we choose? We choose the golden mean for that day between extremes, something here, something there, extremes, and we choose the golden mean. It could be today, it could be here. Tomorrow could be here, could be there. So it's every day going on what? What you chose to learn as the habit of choosing. It's a marvelous uh, sentence, marvelous phrase. It still works today. And, um, and then we come to modern day about how we interact with, or interrelate with our pa patients and how we interrelate with ourselves. And uh, fear, duty, and courage in a medical setting is very interesting. We act many times because of virtue, but then consider the intern who uh, gets who gets a call at three o'clock in the morning and is dead tired. Let's call him a he, and uh, he uh, saying, "Should I get up or not?" Well, he knows that at seven o'clock in the morning that people are going to say, "What happened? Why didn't you get up?" So that fear alone may be enough to propel that hapless intern, shall we call him? to uh, go and see the patient. But then that's why we're talking about this uh, courage and also the idea of uh, the habit of choosing. Uh, Galen was a uh, second century uh, uh, physician who was, a, who was a, phys a physician to Augustus. And when there was malaria in Rome, he didn't want to stay there and take care of, it, of the emperor. So he went 
to the to the high grounds, and uh, and he maybe shirked his duty, uh, but that's that's what he did. But enough for us. In order to deserve trust, the physician must show courage. The doctor's courage will lend the patient hope. The patient's faith will give the doctor courage. It's a uh, uh, a um, a circle of, that, uh, that is important to, to recognize. And what are the limits uh, about self-confidence versus self-righteousness, right? The surgeon will do an operation, perhaps, on scientific basis, learn, read, as opposed to bravado. Oh, I think this is going to work. I'm going to do it. Well, do you have any, have any evidence? No, no, I know it's going to work. Well, that's bravado. The other part of it is scientific basis and, uh, and, 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 head, and head in that direction. The lifeguard will uh, see somebody drowning uh, 20 feet off, off the shore, go in, save them. However, that same person might be engulfed in a fire, an oil fire around him, and it's sure death that the, uh, 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 that the lifeguard will go in, and that's foolhardiness. So those kinds of things we talk about every day. And of course, there's a Marine who's charging up the hill, and, um, and his idea is to take the hill, that's the mission, and the, uh, the combatant does this, I give up, and the Marine has a gun and says, well, do I shoot him, <laughs> or do I take him prisoner? The right thing to do is to take him prisoner, but that uh, holds back his mission to go take the hill. So those kinds of things are rather important uh, life lessons that we do basically every day. Well, we have 17th and 18th century philosophers that enter into the record, and I promise this is the last slide on, on philosophy. Uh, we have what we call de deontological ethics. It's duty ethics. Kant was the, uh, uh, was the uh, proponent of that. The moral imperative says that act every day, act in such a way that your action at that point will be a law of nature forever. Now that's a moral, a moral tenet that's interesting, isn't it? Everything I do, based on whatever the situation is, I have to act in such a way that that will be a law that everyone should follow a moral law. That's a hard thing to come by, but that was in the, uh, that was Immanuel Kant. Utilitarian ethics is a little different. The most good for the most people. The calculus of utility. This is a proponent brought forth by David Hume, Jeremy Bentham, and John Stuart Mill. And then there's the social contract uh, ethics. I, I find this amusing, but sometimes very true. How did we get to like each other and, and respect each other? And the idea is that, look, I won't beat you on the head if you don't beat me on the head. There's a lot to that. It's not something that we, we want to live by, but somehow that could be what was in the background bringing us uh, towards, uh, towards what we have today, that we're not beating each other on the head, at least not for the most part. Well, getting to the crux of the matter, um, when I was in Louisville in 1981-82, there was this medical history club uh, that I joined. Uh, it was in it was made in 1924, and there were only 30 members. And every third year, you had to give a talk. And uh, I wasn't, of course, I was Greek, and they said, well, you know, give a talk on something Greek. And I said, well, no, that's all, no. Uh, so um, as I was running with my pump technician, uh, John Keller, he was a uh, veteran, wounded veteran hero in Vietnam. And he was about this big. I, I wouldn't fool with him. He was built. Strong. We, we used to run through bad neighborhoods together. I never felt uh, afraid of anything as long as I had him with me. And uh, we had this wonderful relationship. And, uh, and I thought then, do, uh, do, do my patients have as much trust in me as I have in John? So I started asking him some questions about how many uh, winners of the uh, Medal of Honor became physicians. And he said, I doubt any of them that did that. And then I realized uh, maybe we're, that's a little bit high. So I went to the next um, uh, award, which was the Navy Cross. And uh, who takes care of the Marines? It's the Navy doctors. So I wrote a letter to the Department of Defense. Uh, can you tell me how many doctors um, won the uh, Navy Cross for valor in Vietnam? And uh, two weeks later, I got a letter back. And uh, there were four names. So well, we've got a story here. So the story is that what I published here, Physicians of the Navy Cross, this was published in uh, 88 or so, and it's about four uh, Navy surgeons. 
who uh, removed uh, an undetonated <coughs> missile from a body part. <laughs> so this is a, a, a rocket that was embedded in the Vietnamese regular. See this? You see this? This is the firing pin. Goes straight. It's the fire, whatever it hits, it blows up. This is the uh, iliac crest, yeah. one centimeter away from the iliac crest. This Providence was kind to this man, even though he had this thing embedded in his chest wall. And it showed up in uh, the emergency room to uh, the chief of surgery, uh, Captain Harry Dinsmore. And this is what he looked like at the time of presentation. And, uh, and Harry Dinsmore came to see him. And who was Harry Dinsmore? He was born in Pennsylvania. His father was an uneducated tailor. Uh, his mother was a teacher. His older brother was an internist. He went to the University of West Virginia, then medical school in Georgetown, and he was in surgical training in the Navy, and he was a chief uh, of surgery at the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis. Well, uh, he put the patient on, on, the, uh, on the schedule, and uh, Marine General, uh, Major General, uh, wished uh, Densmore good luck. So they put uh, uh, sandbags around the patient. Lieutenant Commander John Giles, uh, who was a physician, surgeon, volunteered to do the operation. Giles explained that he was divorced. The impact on his family would not be as bad as Densmore. Chilling. Right? Chilling. Two Navy corpsmen uh, volunteered to help. Dinsmore refused all offers except for Petty Officer Alliance, who was a demolition expert. So they put everything together. Here they are, the, the, uh, the bags uh, that would perhaps uh, help Dinsmore. Uh, it was an unexploded rocket like we talked about. Before he went uh, to the operating room, he was a religious man. He wrote a letter to his wife wondering if this was going to be the last time he ever wrote to her. He ordered a general anesthetic, and everyone left the room with the exception of uh, John Lyons, who was the chief petty officer. Uh, I was talking to, um, uh, to uh, Dinsmore, and uh, I said, well, how did you do it? And he uh, had to compose himself. He started hearing. And he says, well, you know, I'm right-handed, so I held a rocket with my left hand. I took the scalpel, and I put it all the way around, and, and Lyons was there. And Lyon said, don't move it, Doc. Don't move it. Just take it easy. Take it out. Imagine. He did take it out. Took it outside. Lyons took it out and exploded it. And then the, uh, the operation went on. It was a tough extraction, as I said. He went to chapel afterwards. And uh, this is what it looked like after the, uh, the uh, was out. This is the letter that he uh, shared with me, Dinsmore, about the letter back to This is the second letter. The one letter that he knew he was okay. He said he uh, had a hard time writing this because he was shaking most of the time. This is Officer Chief Petty Officer John Lyons with the un with the um, with the, with the uh, missile. And uh, at near the end of my uh, uh, discussion with him, he looked at he talked to me. We were Harry and Gus, and this is just a job you can't give to anyone else. This is duty, and that's what he had to do. He received the uh, Navy Cross in the following citation. Every time I read this, I, uh, I get a little uh, emotional. Sorry if I do that. The President of the United States takes pleasure in presenting the Navy Cross to Captain Harry H. Dinsmore, Medical Corps, United States Navy, for service as set forth in the following citation. For extraordinary heroism. On 1 October 1966, while serving as Chief of Surgery at United States Navy Support Activity Da Nang, Republic of Vietnam. With full knowledge of the serious hazards involved and in complete disregard for his own personal safety, Captain Dinsmore volunteered to perform a surgical operation to remove a live 60 millimeter mortar shell from the chest wall of Private First Class Nguyen Long, Army of the Republic of Vietnam. The impact fuse of the mortar shell was partially activated and could easily have detonated at any time during the operation, resulting in certain death to Captain Dinsmore and his patient. Exhibiting outstanding professional skill and calmness, 
Captain Dinsmore took command of the situation and successfully removed the shell. By his heroic conduct and fearless devotion to duty, Captain Dinsmore saved the life of the patient and upheld the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. Uh, imagine, uh, I asked um, a few of my colleagues, I said, what would you do? And, and they looked at me and I said, I would do the same. And I believe them. It's a matter of duty. But he did it. And, and, and that's what happened. Petty Officer John Lyons received the, um, the, silver, the Silver Star. Where is it? Uh, the, the Silver Star is one below the uh, Navy Cross. Uh, uh, well, the epilogue, uh, and I looked him up. Uh, I never really talked to him after that uh, at the interview. Uh, in addition to the Navy Cross, he was awarded the National Defense Medal, Navy Unit Commendation Medal, and all the rest that you see. Uh, his epilogue or his uh, his um, uh, funeral uh, or his uh, the citation uh, for his funeral. The level of skill and concern of, and the well-being of the community brought a new level of modern medicine to, uh, uh, to the area. He will be remembered fondly by his former patients and colleagues, etc., etc. He was a quiet and thoughtful man, a generous and loving father and husband. He gave his last full measure to all he undertook, and he was finally remembered and sadly missed by his family and friends. That was... Captain Dinsmore. Well, Lieutenant Commander David A. Taft was on duty when this thing came in. It was a rocket through the knee of a, uh, of a Marine. He was still alive. Uh, he went to see the patient. Who was Lieutenant Commander David Taft? Uh, he was born in, in uh, Wisconsin. He went to a, a college at, in Iowa, in University of Iowa Medical School, and he's received his training at Ohio State University at that time uh, with uh, Zollinger, Zollinger Allison syndrome. Uh, Zollinger was one of the uh, great educators at the time. Uh, this is a uh, picture of the uh, Navy, I mean the Marine Corps uh, camp uh, where he was stationed. This is a picture from the, uh, I got all these from him, uh, from a helicopter in Vietnam. Uh, this is real, huh? Uh, one of our Marines was uh, was uh, shot, and here he is uh, being tended to by one of the um, uh, one of the corpsmen. And this again is in the in the field of battle there with a, a helicopter being taken uh, taken off and taking the wounded off. Sometimes I look at this picture and I think of myself in the emergency room at San Francisco General Hospital. It's not unlike this. We didn't weren't you know, wearing uniforms. I'm sure most of the surgeons in this room know what it's like to be in a in a, in a trauma situation. This one, the problem with this one is that you never knew whether there were concealed weapons or concealed bombs. Uh, here is the, uh, the, the rocket that went through the knee of this uh, wounded Marine. Well, uh, he, had, he, he asked the anesthesiologist to place a, a spinal anesthetic, cleared the area, and uh, he asked uh, Daniel Benedict Henry, a corpsman, to help him do the extraction. They did it very quick above the knee amputation. The corpsman took the, uh, the, uh, the limb with the rocket in it, and he uh, it safely exploded it, but, did, but, uh, but Taft didn't know this. <laughs> he, he, was, he thought it was, an, uh, it was an unexpected explosion. He said he started to shake at that time because he thought it was an unusual uh, situation, but everyone was fine. Here he is uh, in repose, uh, and here he is with his buddies. He had a little uh, elan about him, uh, even in the telephone conversation. He was awarded the uh, Navy Cross, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and Daniel uh, Benedict Henry also was awarded the Navy Cross. To give you another emphasis on how real these things were, um, uh, Henry was uh, killed in action in a mortar attack some six months after he performed this, uh, this duty here. Uh, the aftermath of this uh, uh, of this award uh, was notoriety. He received a lot of anti-war letters. Uh, he went into surgical practice in Seattle, Washington, happily married. He uh, was an amateur medical historian. Uh, same uh, Taft. Uh, he 
served in Operation Desert Storm. He was with the 1st Marines in Somalia, and he was assigned to Camp Pendleton in 1994. He died in 2002. <clears throat> the four names that I got, um, one of them was dead. And uh, his mom uh, lived uh, about 60 miles from me. I was in Louisville, Kentucky. His mother lived in maybe 80 miles in Frankfurt. No, not in Frankfurt, in Lexington. So I said, um, Martha, my wife, get some flowers or we're going to visit Mrs. Beth. So um, uh, the, the subject is uh, Lieutenant James B. Beck, United States Navy. He was known when he was in Vietnam to fly into areas to deliver babies, take care of people uh, outside of his duties. He was a uh, thoughtful, wonderful person. So he was he was dead, and we went to visit Mrs. Rose Beck, and here she is, in Lexington, Kentucky. It was a rather emotional time. She looked at me, and uh, she saw her son, and uh, of course, she teared, my wife teared, and I tried to compose myself. I gave her the flowers, and she sat down. You can see she walked through the cane. She had two canes there. Lovely lady. Anyway, she told me the story. And uh, the story is very interesting. His father was a manager for a dairy corporation. His mother was a teacher, Mrs. Beck, teacher. He had four uncles, all of them physicians. And one of his friends died of a brain tumor. He remembered, his mother told me, he remembered that, that his friend was in pain and crying all the time. And he thought at that time he was going to be a physician. So he went to the University of Kentucky, graduated summa cum laude, medical school with praise at Vanderbilt, no small matter. He was an intern at the uh, University of Kentucky. And this is a picture that I took. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm really a, not a very good photographer because this didn't have to be there. But that's who he, that's who he, who he looked like. <coughs> he also, uh, his mother showed me his, uh, his uh, scrapbooks. Of course, in the scrapbook was this Michael DeBakey. And he, uh, he uh, um, he really adored him and wanted to be just like him. Anyway, when uh, <clears throat> when he was on call, a wound came in. I mean, a, a marine came in with a um, with a um, a buttock wound, and it was discovered that he had an unexploded, highly um, highly um, explosive fuse embedded in his uh, in his buttock. He took uh, control of the whole area, <clears throat> cleared the area, got sandbags. <clears throat> and uh, delivered a spinal anesthetic, and he, his mother told me, ran the scalpel around it and carried it outside, and it was detonated. For this, uh, James Beck received the Navy Cross. Here he is being awarded the Navy Cross by a Lieutenant General in the Marine Corps. And this is uh, a former medic who uh, was an emergency room physician, and uh, he was uh, lauded uh, in the, in the newspapers and further and afterwards. Uh, after, uh, after the aftermath, he still had some notoriety, as you saw. Uh, he went into family medicine, uh, lived in California, two children. And in 1974, he died of, uh, at 33 years of age of abdominal carcinomatosis, which is a very rare situation. It's probably caused by the Agent Orange. And one of the reasons I say that is because uh, his mother used to send him um, um, Kool-Aid because the water tasted so bad that he couldn't drink it otherwise. And so the Kool-Aid got to him, but he was drinking Agent Orange, and that's probably why he got the uh, uh, abdominal carcinomatosis. And when I asked Mrs. Back whether James uh, thought he himself was a hero, she said, no, no, not my son. Lieutenant Commander David H. Lewis, United States Navy. Who was he? He was presented with this x-ray, with an unexploded grenade in the thigh of a Marine. <clears throat> Four days before he was going home, he was in, on call. Who was he? His father was a pediatrician. Uh, his mother was a nurse. Uh, he went to high school in Rochester, Denison University, and the University of Rochester, which at that time and today is one of the great universities, one of the great medical schools in the country. 
He had his uh, surgical training at St. Albans Hospital. This uh, unexploded grenade lodged uh, and was in the thigh of a Marine. Lewis is on call, scheduled to go home in four days. And the chief of the evacuation hospital, who was a hematologist, Captain James J., offered to assign the duty to another surgeon. I was talking to Lewis, and, and he said, Gus, who's he going to give it to? <laughs> Is he going to give it to somebody else who's going to say, well, okay, you go and you possibly you die? No, no, you go, you die. No, no. And he knew this. He couldn't possibly allow that to happen. He said, look, I'm on call. I'll take care of it. He was very sanguine about the whole situation until one of the corpsmen came up to him and said, Doc, uh, give me your arm. He said, what are you talking about? I need to cro type and cross you. That's when he started to shake. He said uh, the idea was that not only they type and crossing my patient, but they're also going to type and cross me in case I get into this explosion and then they have to resuscitate me. He told me that that was a, a wake up moment. <clears throat> Nevertheless, uh, he gave the spinal anesthesia, cleared the area, and uh, he told me, quote, I just pulled it out. <clears throat> and he did. And they gave it to, he brought it outside, and, and it was a dead man. This is the wound that he uh, that he made to take that out. This is he writing, uh, I assume, writing back to his uh, wife. And this is he in a, in a repose with his uh, other buddies here. I kind of was uh, partial to him. Notice how short he is. <laughs> uh, nice guy. They're all nice guys. And here he is playing football with his friends on. This is uh, China Beach, yeah. He received the uh, naval, uh, naval Navy Cross for his uh, for his for his, uh, ex, uh, his, his courage, and uh, this is a uh, this uh, is a, a Navy uh, Vice Admiral awarding him the, the, uh, the Navy Cross. He of course had some notoriety, uh, and in the epilogue he had mixed feelings about the award because. He didn't think he did a whole lot. He didn't think, see himself as a hero. And I think if you talk to people who are bona fide heroes, that's what they always say. Look, I didn't do anything. All I did was my duty. And, uh, and then when you hear that, you know, you know that this person is, a, is a, what you would call a real hero. He had two children. Uh, he was in private practice. Uh, he's still alive. I tried to get hold of him. He never answered my calls. And maybe he just didn't get, but uh, he was 83. He still is 83 years old and he practic practices in Martinsville, Virginia. Now, what were they thinking when they were scrubbing, right? Here they need not to, they, do, they don't need this whole amount of epinephrine to make them like this, right? What were they thinking? They were washing their hands and saying, well, I'm about to go in there and take out an unexploded part of the body part, and I might, get, I might die. You know, when, when we say we're courageous sometimes, well, you know, we're making courageous moves, but the patient's going to die, not me. You know, it's sad to say it that way, but that's true. Now, now they both could die, right? And so, uh, so that, that's, that's an interesting thing. What the hell were they thinking about? And what about their patients? They had no rational choice, of course. They had to lay down and have, have faith in their physician. Uh, the fates are interlinked, to be sure. Patients, the patient's faith lends the surgeon courage. And the decisions are tempered by fear, unknown outcome versus disease progression. We do that today, except generally we don't, we don't put our, our lives on the line. The faith in the surgeon's skill and knowledge forms the basis for the patient's courage. And this interrelated courage requires endurance, trust, and moral conviction on both sides. In 1983, I think, Yes, 83. I did the third or fourth neonatal heart transplant. And this is the picture of that being put in. You can tell, give an idea just how big that heart is. The little baby with the hypoplastic left heart syndrome. We were trying to do that in those days instead of in Norwood. And uh, at those days, we really didn't even know where this heart would grow. We didn't know how we were going to do the biopsies. You couldn't do a biopsy in a little kid like that. We, we basically didn't know, but we did know one thing, that this child was going to die. And did that child deserve a chance? And this was not 
rocket science. You just put the heart in and you give them prost and you give them cyclosporin, and then you hope the heart grows, and it did. And uh, 14, 14 years later, or I guess it was 12 years, 12 to 14 years later, uh, the child uh, re rejected and died. And I was living in Chicago at the time, and uh, and uh, mom called me to give the eulogy. Mom called me to come. I came. And, I was expected just to stay there. She says, well, would you give a eulogy? I had five minutes. And uh, <clears throat> and the only thing that came out was the truth. Well, everyone was saying how wonderful medical science was to give this child 12 years. My thoughts were how much we failed this child because we didn't get him to live a normal life and that how much importance it is to continue the research and all the things that we do to give a kid the next time like this a full life of uh, unadulterated uh, happiness. <clears throat> this is a girl who's still alive. I think she's about 25 years post-op. That's not her baby. I think someone sent it to me and told me that that was her baby. It isn't. I think it's either it's a family member or something. She's still doing fine. <clears throat> and when you talk about courage and you talk about um, um, areas of confidence and areas of uncertainty, the first time you do an operation, or the first time you do something like the heart-lung machine, you know, you don't have a whole lot of knowledge or competence, so you depend a lot on courage. So this is what I call the knowledge line, or the not knowledge curve. When there's a lot of confidence, you don't need a whole lot of courage. When the confidence gets less and less, you need more courage. To the point here, when you do the cardiopulmonary bypass for the first time, and your patients and you need a lot of courage. And this is the, basically the history of medicine, when we had intrepid figures, courageous figures, doing things that uh, we just look back and say, how could they have done that? And yet they did, and they have propelled us to the current state of affairs that we are right now. <clears throat> so how do we help each other out, and how do we use these uh, tenets and these uh, virtues in our own lives. We, in a couple of moments, I mean in a, in, a, in a short area, we could voluntarily share our data, which we do. We should have participate in surgeon-led outcomes analysis that have other successful models in the country. And the surgeons much have the courage, not only to do their operations, but to participate and uh, have the courage to change based on uh, good da data and, and uh, and knowledge. <clears throat> in our communities are men and women who have demonstrated their courage in a brave and noble manner by conditions that have been presented to them by fate. Their virtuous response, as Aristotle would say, was determined by an excellent character that was trained by family education and spirituality. In today's world, surgeons are not called upon to display the courage that Marines showed at Iwo Jima. Nor are we asked to risk and sacrifice our lives, as did the many firemen, policemen, and other rescuers at Ground Zero and the Pentagon on September 11, 2001, when we, as a people, responded in the greatest traditions of our heritage and moral fiber. Rather, our courage is displayed in more quiet moments. It's during preparation, research, and endless critical review of our outcomes. <clears throat> our courage is shown in our ability to humbly accept our triumphs, but more importantly, to learn from and endure our failures. Our courage is necessary to earn the respect, confidence, and trust of our patients, even as we tread in areas of uncertainty. <clears throat> It is no secret to the men and women of our, in our profession, and oftentimes we need, that oftentimes we need to display courage in the operating room. As previously noted, we should endeavor to de decrease risk and decrease the need for courage. Uncertainty, however, always enters our theater at unexpected and difficult moments. These are the times that through training, knowledge, and compassion, our profession has repeatedly proven the timber and character of its members. <clears throat> In the end, 
The synergy of interrelated courage will result in interaction that transforms the nature of competence, compassion, compliance, and gratitude. We will look into the eyes of our patients and see the essence of what we do. We will sense their innocence, we will respect their courage, and we will endure with them. We have a lot of time for discussion, and I'm happy to do that, and also uh, in, engage in some of the philosophical uh, parts of what I've discussed and what perhaps is on your mind. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, that, thank you. That's, you're, you're kind. You're kind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're kind. You're kind. Thank you. Um, well, we don't have to have a definite silence. So who has got some kind of... Maybe cross there. You're very, you're very kind. Yeah. You're, you're very kind, and thank you very much. It's taken that way. Yes. Don't sell yourself short. Amen. Amen. Well said. Uh, you were intently. Uh, you know what I do when I give a talk? I, I, I concentrate on one or two people. He's gone. But I concentrated on you because if I knew I had you, I knew I had everyone else. So, so tell me, what questions do you have? I think rounds are, rounds are over. Thank you very much. <clears throat>